Thanks very much, Kaya, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Yi from the University of Melbourne. Uh, it's a pleasure today to have the opportunity to talk to you about the Access Hyper Social Racial Economy Projects, or ASS 2200. I'd like to first acknowledge our project team. As you can see, a lot of people involved in this project, so I really wouldn't have met here without all the important contributions. So first of all, I would like to give you a bit of background on this project, what is ASP 2200 and what we aim to achieve. So ASP 2200 really is a community-based project that aims to develop high-resolution atmospheric regional modeling capacity, initially at 2.2 grid spacing across Australia and our surrounding region, using the access regional model. Um, the project intends to provide a common platform that will help facilitate research and model development activities to advance our scientific understanding of atmospheric processes uh, from continent wide to uh, kilometer scale. And it really represents a flagship collaboration between CLEX, uh, the Bureau, NCI, and Access and I. So, our project has three overarching aims. Um, first of all, we would really like to be able to unite the national atmospheric modeling community. Um, we know historically um, the regional atmospheric modeling activities here in Australia have been lacking coordination you know, on the national level. Quite often, uh, different research groups tend to use different models, and even when they use the same model, they tend to use different configurations of the model looking at different parts of the country. And very rarely do we have the opportunity to coordinate and you know, uh, enable meaningful uh, communication of uh, knowledge. So, ALS 2200 really aims to provide a common framework and best practice approach to hopefully bridge across the traditional boundaries between the individual groups and to facilitate community building and collaboration. Our second aim is to be able to make efficient use of resources. And to do that, we're not only providing an advanced modeling framework, but also a community approach to, for instance, developing data set, developing evaluation methods, diagnostics, and toolboxes. And we also provide the community with the opportunity to co design experiments, to document and archive model outputs, and make them easily available to the broader community. And lastly, we hope to be able to do transformative science that has a clear path to impact. Um, to achieve that, the design of this project, you know, from its uh, inception, has been strategically aligned with the recent operational implementation at Bureau and at Met Office. Um, this would allow you know, the synergy of some of our scientific activities to improve the knowledge transfer, making sure that the knowledge learned by the community um, is relevant for the ongoing model development. So, ASP 2200 was started about a year and a half ago, and um, you know the model configuration we adopted back then was really what was being used at Bureau at the time, uh, which is shown here on the left column of this table. But while the project was being developed, the Bureau's regional atmospheric model system was upgraded to a newer version of the UN, uh, which has a new version of the science configuration as well, and also you know finer. Uh, horizontal grid spacing and increased vertical levels, so you can see on the right. So, one of our immediate plans really is to, you know, in support from XS and I, to be able to upgrade our system also more closely in line with the Bureau's recent implementation. So, in the past year or so, there have been some really major uh, model optimization effort led by our CMS team uh, of Clex. Um, in terms of improving the model um, performance as well as the efficiency. So at the initial stage of the project, um, our system was only able to complete you know, about three forecast days per day at a cost of 9.3 KSU per day. And if you further consider time spending on reconfiguration and driving models, etc., we're practically looking at only about one forecast day per day. And one of the key problems was that the model was spending too much time just reading and writing the files. So one of our first target really was to improve the efficiency of IOM. And this was achieved through enabling the IOM server in the UN model um, through the open MP. And this in combination with uh, MPI IOM, a tune for Gali, 
we were able to significantly reduce the time spent on I.O. from about 25 minutes to uh, only 80 seconds. And then with the I.O. resolve, it became really feasible to now to consider computational optimization through the CPU scaling. So Dale has been doing a lot of uh, testing in this space and with the best efficiency on the Casca Lake on the NCI, uh, then you know, our system was able to complete about 31 forecast days per day at very similar cost. Uh, the performance is even better on Sapphire Rabbit. Uh, with the best efficiency, uh, our system was able to complete about 55 forecast days per day at a reduced cost. So effectively, we're really looking at about you know a factor of 18.5 improvement in the speed uh, of, of the model at a much reduced cost. So with a significant improvement in the you know computational performance and efficiencies, it really opens up a lot of opportunities to the community. Uh, so in the past several months, we've been able to complete a series of the simulations. You know, with a wide range of uh, configurations, focus on uh, a number of uh, significant you know, high impact weather events, as I show in this table. So the length of the simulation um, varies from several days to several weeks to several months, really depends on the nature of these events. So in the next few slides, I'm going to just give you some snapshots of these simulations we've uh, performed. Um, so you know, that, you know what these uh, simulations uh, entail. So these are from you know, several pilot projects we call. Uh, the first project is led by Human Ayer, you know, who is looking at the role of the frontal dynamics in the 2019-2020 Black Summer Reef fires here in Southeast Australia. So this animation is showing uh, the simulations of the surface meteorological condition uh, during this events. For instance, we're looking at a specific community here on the uh, upper left, and we can see you know, the periods of this uh, dry region forma formation in, in the interior of Southeast Australia. So the study really interested in understanding the mechanisms driving you know, the, the formation of this dry region we're seeing here. So here we're just, you know, looking at the zooming area of Southeast Australia. Um, we've got simulated vertical wind uh, uh, in the upper left, where you can see, you know, the development of the really active boundary layer um, uh, responsible for the formation of these uh, uh, active uh, convective rows characterized by this line structure you see in this red and blue, red and blue. Um, and this, um, boundary layer really is able to connect you know, the dry air above the boundary layer uh, and the surface, uh, which you can see here in the cross section along this red line, uh, where the really strong downward mixing associated with those convective rows are able to bring the hot, dry and uh, hot and dry air from above the boundary layer all the way down to the surface, which really has contributed to the intensification of the water during this period. The second project I want to show is um, this one to investigate uh, the 2022 um, the record breaking flooding events in Southeast Australia, um, in New South Wales, Queensland. So, what I'm showing here is the animation from uh, the brightest temperature observed by the Himori satellite on the left and the simulations on the proxy field on the right. So. It's indeed really impressive to see how well the model is able to capture, you know, the really complex uh, dynamics during the events, um, both from large scale uh, down to the mesoscale. scale. Another thing I would like to know is that there's been a lot of interesting weather happening in this uh, period of time uh, as well. For instance, you know, the formation of uh, tropical cyclones. Uh, later, you'll see here in the northwest of the continent, and also the development of the atmospheric river and the formation of uh, the, the line of convection along the east coast as well during this event. So, if you're interested in this kind of events, you know, these simulations are ready for you to use. Um, here, I'm just showing some initial evaluation on the rainfall in Southeast Australia uh, from the various uh, configuration months. 
So you can see some of the configurations I'm doing better job than others, capturing not only the amount but also the spatial distribution of the rainfall as compared to the graded station data set. Also, many of the configuration plans are able to capture the diamond variability of the rainfall uh, compared to the radar oscillations as well. So the last project I wanted to show here is a more recent one uh, where we're looking at the variability of rainfall in the north of Queensland um, during uh, three NGO events assembled across a different state of Enzo. So here we're comparing the uh, mean rain rate um, under the various phases of NGO uh, with observation on the left, uh, simulation without the ocean in the middle, and simulation for with the ocean in, on the right. And we also regraded our data to 25 kilometer resolution, uh, which we think is you know what the A web product is uh, more you know uh, more can, can skillfully represent. So overall, we could see that uh, the simulations are able to capture uh, both the uh, intensity and also the spatial variability of the rainfall for the various phases of MGO, in particular if you're looking at uh, phase 7 and phase 6. Although the simulations seem to be you know, having the rainfall more strongly aligned with the topography in some of the regions. But when we're looking at you know, a really local level, for instance, here I'm showing a comparison between the observed rainfall from the Townsville radar and the simulated rainfall from the same region um, at the, the, the model's natural resolutions. Then you start to see um, those you know, discrepancy becoming more evident. Right? Some of these discrepancies are probably easier to understand, uh, some of them probably less straightforward. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes to this fine scale, it becomes really quite challenging, you know, trying to understand uh, the differences between the observations and the model. So I think that takes me to, you know, my last slide, which is to note, you know, the challenges associated with some of these high resolution uh, simulations. I think this is relevant to not only the OS2200, but probably uh, the high resolution simulations in general. Um, and this is also relevant to the breakout discussion we're going to have later today. So, um, scientifically, I think this is probably bringing some challenges in model evaluation, especially with those fine resolution details. How can we evaluate the simulations and what data set to use, what to use as a benchmark, and how to diagnose those complex you know, multi scale dynamics with those fine resolution details, for instance. It also brings in some technical challenges as well. Um, so it probably has implications on the work needs to be done in terms of optimization and scaling of the model code, you know, dealing with large data sets uh, as well as storage. And it probably you know, also implies um, uh, from, you know, the redevelopment of the programming framework and, and the simulation uh, workflows as well. So finally, I just wanted to know that, you know, what the community is interested in is what we're interested in. So if you have any ideas, any you know, cases you, you think are worth running uh, for the community, um, please bring your ideas on board and let us know. Thank you very much. Maybe as I am from the SW, thank you for your this work. Uh, at 2.2 kilometer, Australian cities will be represented by several green fonts, which is really interesting to know. We house the urban representation of the Australian 200, but also more importantly, the urban plan moving forward. Um, to make sure that we are representing some of these processes for many of the challenges we should be exploring and others correctly at that point in the session. Yeah, that's a Really great questions. I think you know the processes we really want to understand you know, ranges from large scales you know, all the way down to local scale, city scale. I think that's already you know, we, you, your work is, is uh, focused on. I think there's going to be a trade-off here. Um, the really the idea is to be able to reasonably represent you know the large scale impacts and all the way down to 
you know, the fine enough scale that you could um, represent the local weather processes. So we think that 2.2 is, first of all, what the Bureau um, has been using and also will be used in the future ensemble ones. So uh, this really, again, as I mentioned, is strategically aligned with the Bureau's uh, future plan. And also, as I mentioned earlier in the table, we do have the flexibility to consider um, final resolution as well once we upgrade it to uh, the latest version uh, of the UN. So you have you know, the horizontal grid spacing uh, all the way down to 1.5 kilometers, which obviously can be an option in the future. So eventually, I think. Again, this really depends on what the community needs. For some events, we probably don't need to go down to a really fine scale resolution. And if we do need to investigate those events, probably there will be a better model to use. Um, so, all of our um, work in the future will be driven primarily by what the community needs and will build the capacity accordingly. Thanks so much, Lee.